Let's open up our Bibles to Exodus chapter 3. Where we left off. But before anything, we're going to pray again. And ask the Lord to meet with us tonight in a special way. Why? Because we should believe that He comes every time we seek Him. Let's do that. Let's pray. Let's go straight to the throne of grace. We can do so boldly because of the blood of Jesus. And we can seek grace in time of need. If you need grace tonight, if you need grace to move on, if you need grace to move forward, if you need grace in your situation, come to the throne of grace tonight. Oh, Father, we need you desperately. We ask, God, that you would pour out your grace upon each person in this place. Yes. Father, we look to you in faith. And we come in the name of Jesus because it is through his name we have any access to you. God in heaven, we tremble at your word. And Lord, we come, some in weakness, some in strength. And your word says, is any of you suffering? Let him pray. Is any among you cheerful? Let him sing praise. And Lord... Regardless of the situation we find ourselves in tonight, it always demands a response. There is always a response. Whether we're suffering, we do something. Whether we're cheerful, we do something. And so, Lord, we come in faith to you. And, Father, we ask that as we open your precious word, as we open up this treasure of revelation, we pray that you would speak to us. And we know that your Holy Spirit does not work apart from this word, so we pray that the Holy Spirit would minister to people through the word through the word tonight, Lord. We pray, as we're going to find out that God is a fire, that you would consume us tonight as the fire that you are. We hunger for you, God. We hunger for you. And if we don't hunger for you, we pray for a deeper hunger for you, Lord. Father, we pray by faith that tonight, as you are a consuming fire, you would consume things in our lives that are not of you. You would consume it. You would consume it once and for all. We come into your house by faith, believing that this is your house. Amen. Believing that your presence is here. So, Father, we just pray against every, every distraction, Lord. Everything that might take away from the Word of God. Every bird that would come and steal the Word from the soil of our hearts. We pray against it. And we pray that your Word would go with power. Great power tonight, Lord. That every man would be hidden and the voice of Christ would be heard. Lift us up. Lord, take us on the road to Emmaus as you open up the scriptures and let our hearts burn like those two disciples. Let our hearts burn like those two disciples. And so, Father, we pray that you would permeate this place with your glory. Absolutely take over this place. Let time have no factor. Let our flesh have no factor. Let our distractions have no factor. But, Lord, we pray that you come in like a flood and do as you please. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Exodus chapter 3. A couple weeks ago, thank you. A couple weeks ago, we talked about the man Moses. The man Moses. And how he was raised up by godly parents. And how Moses really was surrounded by godly people and how that affected his life. And one of the main points from Exodus chapter 2 was how Moses, though he had this sense of calling in his heart, he had this sense of calling in his heart from Acts 7, 23 to 25. He implemented too soon. It, it wasn't God's timing. It wasn't God's will. It wasn't in God's strength. And we learn how God oftentimes, if not all the time, will take a man and enroll him in the school of God. Meaning what? God will take a man and do what he needs to do through the man and in the man in order to prepare him for a call. In order to prepare him to fulfill the will that he has for his life. And God does that how? What is the school of God? Through trials. Through circumstances. Through events. Through times of waiting. He takes a man and he brings that man to a place in his life in which he prepares his character, his faith, his disciplines. In order to lift him up to the place where he needs to be and to be most effective at it. And so we must yield to God's timing. We must yield to God's call in the seasons that we find ourselves. Though our hearts might be burning with a passion for something to glorify God. 
And we see here in chapter 3 that we're going to see this man Moses who was enrolled in the school of God now is about to receive that call. And so we, we talked about in Exodus chapter 2 the man of God, Moses. Now we're going to talk about the call of God on Moses. Why are these stories here? So we can just look at them and say, oh wow, this is so cool how God works through others. No, they're examples for us. The principles, though they're not exactly for us, the principles are universal. The principles are timeless. So let's read. In verse 1, Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. And he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that, when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. What can we say about these first six packed-filled verses in chapter 3? Does anybody know the background? Does anybody know approximately what age Moses is at at this point? 40? 40 or 80? Well, he's probably around 80 at this point. We see later on that we get his age. So we're, we're, we don't know exactly what age he's at at this point, but we know that he's old. Er. And when he was first introduced here in Exodus chapter 2. So years have passed by. What can we say about these first six verses here? Whatever you got. Yeah. Considering the time frame of like between chapter two and chapter three, like in his life, he may not, he may have, you know, not necessarily forgotten, but he might, God might not have been top of mind. His promise might not have been top of mind. Okay, so that's one perspective. Maybe he's not necessarily feeling the call as he used to. Maybe he is. Maybe not. What else can we say? Yeah, Tamara. In 4, it says, when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, and he was crazy because like, God didn't speak to Moses until he saw the angel from the Yes, that's right. We're going to talk about that more. We think God always wants to speak to us. No, God waits for you to pay attention. We'll get to that in a moment, yeah. Yes, yeah, Cindy, Adriana. Yeah, I think the Moses growing up as an Egyptian, and then to this time, I think he lost kind of the reverence of God. And this year, kind of God is kind of setting straight, like, this is the type of God I am. It's not just, I'm not just another God. Mm -hmm. Well, God is teaching Moses something about his holiness. And this whole book is really dedicated to the holiness of God. His transcendence, how separate he is from humans. And so he's teaching something about Moses here in these first few verses about worship. Which is so significant. Yeah, Nathan? Um, I'd like to add to that where he tells him to take off the sandals and he comes down to the Lord casually. Mm -hmm. So not to come to the Lord casually? Yeah, with reverence? <coughs> Any other thoughts? Yeah, Leah? Yeah. When he said, I am the God of your father, that, uh, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, he hid his face almost like he was ashamed. Kind of. Yeah, shame, maybe afraid. He says he was afraid to look at God. Sure. What else can we say? Yeah, Tamara. Going back to his, I think God's here is basically telling him that I'm still the same God of your father, so I did not change, even though I've throughout all these years, you know? So it's just a reminder that this covenant is Absolutely. After how many years? It's a long time, 400. Yeah. Not Moses particularly, but with Israel. Yeah, go ahead. So it's um, interesting that it says here that his father-in-law is the priest of Midian, and we don't know what kind of God he served, but the real God, the God of his ancestors, showed up and declared his... Being, you know, two years. Yeah. Well, we know that it's not the right God because we know that his father-in-law later comes to faith in the wilderness. 
So yeah, his father-in-law is a priest of Midian, uh, Midian to a different guy. Uh, excuse me. Any other thoughts for the first six verses? <coughs> yeah, Gurdis. Yeah, um, I believe what it's saying here, um, and the angel of the Lord appeared to him, and later on we see that it's not angel, but it's God himself. Sure. So I believe here that the angel of the Lord means a messenger of the Lord, and I believe was Jesus. Sure. Was the son, let's say. Uh, he was messenger of the Lord, and then he's saying that I'm God, your father. Absolutely. So it wasn't like angel, but was right. messenger. And we talked about that maybe like 17 weeks ago or something, about the angel of the Lord, how the majority of the time it speaks of Jesus. That's debated, but we hold to that, yeah. But when you come to think about it, in a scripture it says, no man <coughs> has ever seen God. Mm -hmm. And here Moses said, he turned up because he was face to face. So what he was saying, we have to think about it. Jesus was son of God, but he was God because his father was God. So the representation of God the Father was in Christ, and there was Jesus who was appearing to him. So when he was saying he was looking at God, I would say this was the God, son of God that he was looking at. This is where it's making reference as an angel. Sure, yeah. So we agree that this is a theophany, this is a pre-incarnate right. Christ. Yes, and we see that many times throughout the Old Testament. Um, I was just thinking also of the contrast of when he was in Egypt, he was a somebody. But God took him out to the desert to teach him that he is a nobody. Great point. In order for God to use him. For Great him point. To be a, you know, somebody. Yes. The lowly of the lowliest. But those lessons, you think you're a somebody, but God can't use you until you realize you're somebody. Absolutely. You come a long way. You're a prince of Egypt. You get anything at the snap of your finger. And here you are. You're a shepherd and you're working for your father-in-law. And now you are in the wilderness with a bunch of sheep. You're in a palace filled with luxury and gold and chariots and education. But God can use them at that point. We're going to find that out at the end of this verse. Let's go ahead. I think I have a question about this. I'm not sure. When he told him to take his sandals off, mm -hmm. uh, is it about um, taking off anything that's stopping him from moving forward to enter that place, that mm -hmm. holy place? Absolutely. That's exactly what it is. But we're going to talk about this. God is not against open-ended shoes, okay? He's not against it. It's what the sandals symbolize. So he's going to be He's going to be telling us here, we see it throughout Scripture, how He does ask us to remove something, to draw nearer to Him. Let's look at verse 1. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And as our sister mentioned already, think about where God has brought this man already in verse 1. L look, at the, the, look at the contrast of chapter 2 and chapter 3 right off the bat. God brought this man to this place in his life. God brought this man and humbled him to this position in his life. God is training this man by doing what he did here. How is he training him? He's Humility. Here's this man who wants to deliver the people. How do we know? Did he have a sense of calling in his life? We talked about that in Acts 7.25. It says that he thought that his brethren would know that he has come to deliver them. This was something that was deposited in his heart. And God knew that was burning in his heart. But he was not prepared. So he says, you know what? Before you deal with people, I'm going to let you deal with some sheep. So go, tend some flock. Go, be patient with them. Name them. Take care of them individually. Walk them. Feed them. And this is amazing because God is about to encounter Moses at a specific in a specific season of his life. What season? Humility, yes. Humbleness, yes. But faithfulness. You need to think about this. I want you right now in your mind to think about every single time God has called a man in the scriptures. A lot of the times, not all the times, a lot of the times, the scripture records that man is doing something when God calls him. That he's doing something. He, he's busy with something. He's doing work. He's getting his blood working. He's not, he's not lazy. Think about it. Samuel, a young boy. What was he doing? He was serving in the temple. 
Elisha, what was he doing? He was with the oxen. He was working in the fields. The disciples, what were they doing? They were fishermen, tax collector. Saul of Tarsus, what was he doing? Persecuting the church. At least he was busy doing something. And he was good at it too. God does not call lazy people. He doesn't. In fact, he sets a standard for those that want to be disciples of him. He says, if you put your hand to the plow and you look back, you're not worthy to be my disciple. Meaning, if you're not focused on this thing called the kingdom of God, if you're going to be looking back at the world and looking back at what your family's doing, what your friend's doing, when they don't want to follow God, you can't. You can't even make the first step of being my disciple. God does not call slothful people, does it? And here's Moses, though he has this burning passion in his heart. He wants to see a nation delivered. And God is not allowed to do that. So what does he do? He watches binging off of Netflix. What does he do? No, he's faithful to the capacity in which God has called him. All right, God, you want to give me a nation? I'll deal with these sheep. I'll take care of these sheep. All right, God, you called me to be a preacher. I feel it, but you didn't give me a pulpit, so I'm going to be faithful in my Walgreens job and use my cashier as a pulpit. If God has put something in your heart and you believe that God is taking you there, you don't just, it's not going to come on a silver platter. Be faithful to the capacity in which he's called you. And know that that is training, and we have to yield to that. Here's Moses about to get called. What was he doing? Sitting on the, in a tent, twiddling his thumbs? No, he was working. He was in the wilderness. He was in the desert. He was tending these sheep. And God says, here, I can use somebody like that. Faithful with little, faithful with much. Faithful in your Bible study, I can put you on a platform if it's my will. Whatever it is, we must be faithful to the capacity in which God has placed us, and that's exactly what Moses is doing here. What else can we say about verse 1? Well, we can look at verse 2. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. What can we say about verse 2? What's so special about a burning bush? Yes. Well, I was just going to say that it caught his eye because there was a fire, but also the bush didn't get burned. didn't get consumed. Yes. Think about it. This is a... Go ahead, Ron. Yeah. Right. And you say... <laughs> it's okay, no problem. Was, were burning bushes uncommon in the wilderness? No. Oh. So you want to go off of that? No, I wanted to say, um, like, verse 1. Yeah. Uh, and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Did yeah. he know that it was a mountain of God? No, but he was about to find out. Yeah. Not necessarily. It's kind of like a commentary on the verse. This is the mountain of God because we're going to find ourselves here in Exodus chapter 19. So it's kind of giving us a heads up. Hey, this is the mountain of God. But that's a great question. Yes? I think that's interesting to compare also. You know, Elijah is living with God on that same mountain. God uses all the forces of nature. Yeah. Talk to and hearing as he's doing the same thing. You said Elijah, right? Yeah. Yes. Elijah. That's a great point. We're going to talk about Elijah today, actually. Were burning bushes on common in the wilderness? No! Burning bushes in the desert would combust in flames all the time, but the difference between those burning bushes and this burning bush is that this burning bush kept burning. And the bush was not consumed. And guess what? That caught his attention. That caught Moses' attention. Do you want to really be a sign and a wonder in this generation? Don't burn for a season. Keep burning for God. You want to really catch people's eyes? Keep burning for God, for God. It's a consistent flame. The flame did not go out. Is it possible? Absolutely. How do you keep a fire burning? Well, the same way you do with a natural fire. You just keep feeding it. You watch over it. You take over it. You make sure that rain doesn't consume it. You make sure the wind doesn't blow over it. You tend to it. They were supposed to keep the fire on the altar in the temple burning day and night. Was that just going to happen magically? No, it was the priest's job to take care of the fire. Young people all the time ask me, how do I keep the fire? Well, how do you keep your campfire going? You keep feeding it. You keep your eye on it. You don't ignore it. And when you keep burning, that's when you get people's attention. You know what we have today? It was, what, July 4th, not too long ago, right? I don't know why I didn't realize it. It seemed like this year I paid more attention to it. 
it, it was like we were in a war zone all day. We were just driving around, ba-boom, 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 ba-boom. I was like, okay, we get it. Let's go to sleep. It's one in the morning. But, you know, I enjoyed the show, sat in the back and saw the fireworks going around. But I thought to myself, you know, these fireworks are a lot like Christians. Once in a while, they go up, they get excited, bang, they make a lot of noise, they look pretty, and then they die. Their fire dies. And just like July 4th weekend, whenever conference comes around, yeah, once a year, let's get on fire for God. Ooh, make a lot of noise on Facebook. Ooh, make a lot of noise at church. Ooh, make a lot of noise in our family. And then it just dies. The world doesn't want fireworks Christians. The world wants burning Christians that keep burning for God. That's what's going to get people's attention. My goodness, it's not hard to start a fire. I see so many Christians get on fire. I see so many Christians start to pray. I see so many Christians that want to read. You know what it's hard to do? Keep doing it. Find somebody that does that, and then you get man's attention. People get excited for God all the time. Find a man that when nobody else is excited about God, they stay excited about God. That's a sign and a wonder. That's what caught Moses' attention. Burning bushes here and there, yeah, 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 I get it. But this one caught him. He says, there's something about this one that's different. It keeps burning. But it's not just that. It's that the bush was not consumed by the fire. There's another element to it. Is that the fire, in another perspective, did not consume the bush. That's another way to catch people's attention. Is when the fires of life come against you and you do not get consumed. Trials and tribulations and persecution, yet you still burn for God. You're not consumed by it. Think about the three Hebrew boys. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. In Daniel chapter 3, 23. What happens? They don't bow to the idol, and the punishment was, I'm going to throw you into a fiery furnace. So what does he do? He says, turn it up seven times harder. Turn the fire up. And here are these three Hebrew boys. They're bound. And it says that the fire was so hot that those that, the servants that grabbed these boys to throw them into the fire were, were killed by the fire. But what happened with those boys? It says in verse 25 that they were in the fire and Nebuchadnezzar stood amazed because though they were in the fire, he says, didn't we throw them bound in the fire? He says, why do I see them unbound? And another man walking in the midst. Think about it. The fire that killed other people did not kill the Hebrew boys. And it made Nebuchadnezzar stand in amazement. See, when you go through hell in life, when disease hits your body, when this hits your life, when this circumstance, when this event comes crashing against you, what would make other people crumble into powder, you don't crumble into powder, and it makes other people look at you and say, how can that be? What is it that you have that keeps you? Why are you not consumed by the fires of life? Why are you not consumed by the trials that you're experiencing? Any fire that you go through that is not based on your own foolishness is by God, and it's for a purpose. Those Hebrew boys went into the fire bound, they came out unbound. And they didn't smell like smoke. The only thing that was gone was the very things that were keeping them bound. See, God puts you to the fire for a reason. Why? The thing that was binding you for so long can only come out through the circumstance that He allows in your life. There's some things that we are so stubborn about that God needs to put us through circumstances in order for us to be free from. Free from pride, I'm going to let you go through this circumstance. The fire doesn't touch you. It touches the thing that was binding you. This, jealousy, envy, all these ugly things. I'm going to let you go through the fire so that you can be free. And you come out, not smelling like smoke, but free from bondage. Burning bush. What else can we say about the burning bush? I don't know why Nebuchadnezzar said he sees like another man and used the term like son of God. I don't know. If this is original or not. But he said he put it in three and there is one more among them. Yeah, he said like one that looks like a son of man. The son of man is a theme throughout the book of Daniel. 
concerning Christ. And Christ uses the Son of Man in the New Testament to, to show the people that he was the fulfillment of all the things that they saw in the book of Daniel. It's a great point, Gino. Thank you. But this is talking more than a burning... Well, why a burning bush? God could appear to, to him in any other way. Why a burning bush? Yes? Well, bush are kind of... It's, it's pretty common that it doesn't just to like find a bush, but like to have this one that's set apart. So it's set apart from everything else. Sure. I believe it's not the bush that we need to focus on. I believe it's the fire. The bush, God appears to himself... As himself, in different ways throughout the scriptures. But there's one thing consistent about this, is that God is a fire. We, we know this. God is love, don't we? We love that about God in 1 John. When is the last time you heard in Hebrews 12, 29 that God is not just love, God is a consuming fire? We don't like to quote that one, do we? Therefore, let us give Him acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a what? Consuming fire. What does that mean? What does it mean that God is a consuming fire? I'm telling you, it would change the way we worship if we know what it means. Give Him acceptable worship with reverence and awe for our God is a consuming... So acceptable worship. So that means that you can give Him unacceptable worship. What does it mean that God is a consuming fire? Um, would it mean that He's just and He can consume people Yes. It means many things. One of it means his judgment, his wrath. Yes. His holiness. Absolutely. What else can we say about God being a consuming fire? Yeah, like a fire. When you let a fire go and you let it really go, it consumes everything. I thank God that he's a consuming fire. I praise God that he's a consuming fire. Why? Because I need fire. Why? Because only consuming fire can consume the ugly things in my life. When is the last time you and I have called upon God to consume us with His fire? God, consume this pride in my heart. It's only your fire that can burn it away. God, consume this lust in my heart. It's only your fire that can take it away. God, consume this jealousy in my heart. It's only your fire that can purge it. We need God to be a consuming fire. You know, this is a unique thing about the consuming fire. Here's a revelation about it. In Deuteronomy, if we can turn to it on the screen, Deuteronomy, I believe it's 426. Or 24, rather. Deuteronomy 424. For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, even a jealous God. The link about Him being a fire to being a jealous God. And as a sister already mentioned, that God is a consuming fire. You know what He wants to do? He wants to consume every area of your life that might take away from you being completely His. Because He's jealous. There's this, the most debated, one of the most debated verses in James chapter 4, verse 5, concerning God. He's talking to the people, the Christians, you adulterous people. You adulterous people, meaning spiritual adultery. You've committed adultery against God. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? And then he says this amazing verse that people debate about what it really means. I believe it means exactly what it says. Do you not know that God yearns jealously for the spirit that he has made to dwell in you? Think about it. God is a jealous God. He yearns jealously for the spirit. He yearns for our inner man to be a part of him. He yearns for the depth of who we are. To know the depths of who He is. And He's a jealous God. A jealous bridegroom for a jealous bride. He's a consuming fire. What does Moses do? He looks. And behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. Verse 3. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. What does this say about Moses' his posture? Now think about this in his physical posture. What is he doing here? He's tending his sheep, whether they're before him or whether they're around him. And here he is walking in the wilderness. And he sees, in his peripheral vision, he sees this burning bush. And he says what? What does it say at first? He looked. Whether it was behind him, beside him, whatever. He looked at it. What does that say about Moses? Curious? Sure. Attentive. Attentive. Yes. 
This man Moses is attentive. This Moses is not daydreaming. This Moses is not a guy that's letting his thoughts carry him away. This man is aware of his environment. This man is controlled within himself. And because of it, he notices it. He notices it. Why is that important for us to know? Because that is the same discipline you and I need to have in order to hear God. It says he looks and he sees the burning bush. But it doesn't say that God spoke to him when he looked at it. It says when he told himself, I will turn aside to see this great sight. So he turns to see this great sight. And then when he did that, verse 4 tells us, when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called him. We talked about this before, but we'll, it's good to remember. That it wasn't until when? Moses gave God his full attention that he heard God speak to him. What can we say about that? We don't pay attention to God. We're not attentive. We're not going to hear anything. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, Liam? Everything will be put in hands. What we, what we read and what we saw, the more we give to God, the uh, more we allow Him to give us. Sure, absolutely. So he was tending his sheep, and then he just like, forget that. We're just looking at that. Sure. <laughs> Let's go. Sometimes we ask for God to speak for us, to speak to us. Sometimes we're so caught up with thinking that He's going to say it just a clear word into our yeah. head or something like that. And a lot of the times He'll just do things around us. He wants us to see that first before He speaks to us directly. He does with Moses, so in this case it's the fire. So like, this isn't uncommon. But what was uncommon was that it wasn't consumed, and that's what got His attention. So Moses was keeping an open mind of how God might be speaking to him. This man has a holy curiosity, a holy hunger. And he has something we all need. He sees this burning bush, he gives it its full attention, it's there when God speaks to him. You had something, yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say, Moses was raised as an Egyptian, right? Mm -hmm. So, like, polytheism is really strong in the Egyptian faith or whatever. So I think that this is the first time when he's full attention to God himself. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there was something that caught his eye, and God is about to make the distinction of he's the true and living God, not the gods that maybe he heard of. Yes. Let this be a lifelong lesson for you and me. That as Gil already mentioned, we think that God is going to shout at us when he wants to speak to us. Not all the time. He wasn't tending a sheep, and then what caused it? It wasn't, hey Moses, I have something to tell you. It's not how he spoke. It wasn't until he stopped, gave it his full attention, and when you give God your full attention, you can expect God to give you revelation. Amen. Think about it. If you have any self-respect, and you're having a conversation with a person one-on-one, -on -one, I don't know about you, but I'll tell you about me, if this person is not giving me the attention that I need in a normal conversation, how am I supposed to share them truths about who I am? How am I supposed to open my heart to this person when they're not giving me their attention? It shows that they don't value what I have to say. And so why would I throw my pearls to someone that won't respect those things? And so what's the difference between us and God? There is no difference. That God has something to say to us, but it's until we give Him our attention when we receive revelation. And so in a meeting like this, I apologize. That when a meeting comes like when it comes to meetings, corporate meetings like this, I'm your friend, I love you, but when it comes to God's house, I'm coming to hear from God. I'm not coming here to sit beside you and to and to no no no. The moment that word opens, I don't know who's standing behind this pulpit, but I believe that that man has been praying for a certain amount of time to hear from God and to give the people of God a word from God. I've come to hear from God. We'll chat afterwards over lunch, but this is God's time. Wonder how much God would speak to us if we really believe that every time we came to church, no matter who was speaking. You say, "Well, oh, this person's not speaking, or that person." God spoke through a burning bush. I come to give God my full attention. My cell phone, 
During church, you will not get a hold of me. Why? Because it's God time. I've come to hear from God. I've come to give Him my full attention. I need revelation. I need it to speak to me. I need a fresh word. Not just corporately, privately. When it comes to me and God time, it's really me and God time. And the devil will try everything to distract you. But you open this word. We don't have burning bushes anymore. You know what? We have a burning book. You open this word and you believe that God will speak through you, to you, through this book. God, I've come to give you my full attention. There can be an earthquake outside. I could not care less. I need to hear from you. I come. Speak for your servant is listening. My heart is open. I'm not just going to look at it. You know you can read the Bible and not really read the Bible? You know that, right? You can read the Bible and not really read the Bible. You can pray and not really pray. How many times have you caught yourself doing that? You're praying, you're thinking about other things. You're, whoa, 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 whoa. God, you're on your throne right now. I apologize, Father. Here I am. Here's my full attention. I'm reading. I'm thinking about laundry. I'm thinking about things i got to do. I'm thinking about homework. And I go, whoa, God's not going to speak to me this way. Here's my full attention. God can speak many ways, but it's, it's often that He speaks when we give Him our full attention. And as our sister mentioned in 1 Kings, here's an example, 1 Kings 19 with Elijah in verse 11. Elijah is having a rough day. Oh, you, you think prophets don't have discouraging days. This man just saw revival. This man just saw fire come down from heaven. And you know what? He runs away when a woman says, I'm going to kill you. What was he missing? A prayer? What was he missing? Bible reading? No, he was missing some food and rest. And so he goes into the wilderness and he's discouraged because he feels like nobody else gets it and he feels like he's the only man of God on earth and he's the only one that has a message on his heart and he feels like he's the only one not compromising. And God says, <sighs> So he goes into a cave and he complains and God appears to him. And how does he appear to him? In verse 11. And he said, Go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. And in verse 13 he says, And Elijah heard it. We want God to speak to us, and we want heaven to rip open. We want that. Speak to me, God. I need something miraculous. I need an earthquake. I need a fire. I need something miraculous. You know what God wants to do? Whisper. Do you think He... Why did He whisper? Because it... When somebody whispers, what do you need to do? Pay attention. Whisper. And it required Elijah to listen and give God his attention. It doesn't take much for a kaboom to happen and say, okay, God's speaking to me. But when you need a word from God, sure he can do it this way. But He will use those circumstances in your life in order for you to lean in so He can whisper. Give God your full attention. Take Moses' surrounding into consideration too. Where is Moses at right now? In a wilderness. Who is Moses with? Nobody. In a wilderness, by himself. That's when God wants to speak and where God wants to speak to you the most. When you're separated from the world, when you're separated from the people, when you're separated from the crowd, it wasn't until Moses was alone that God could speak to them. How many, how many times do we see this throughout the Bible? We think in Genesis 32 that Jacob went out to go find God and wrestle with God. That's not what the Bible says. It says that the angel of the Lord found Jacob and wrestled with Jacob. God waited for Jacob to be alone before he could wrestle Jacob. God waits for you and me to get alone, distracted from all these different things. He wants you to pull out of him for a season in order for him to speak to you. That is the hardest thing about knowing God's will. That is the hardest thing about knowing God. It's getting alone. We do not like to be alone. It, it kills the flesh. 
The flesh hates to be alone. It wants attention. It wants entertainment. It wants fellowship. Those things are good in their respective timing. But God wants you to get alone. Because He's trying to speak and you have too much noise going around. I believe every Christian should take a designated amount of time every year or every few months and just get alone with God. Just get alone. Block out two, three days. Lock yourself in your basement. Go find somebody else's house. Get alone with God because you want to hear what God is saying. Not in some mystical wheel. Take this Bible. Open this Bible. Open your heart and wait on God. Because nobody's willing to do that. They're missing out. Can you imagine if Moses did not give God his attention at this moment? Can you imagine if there was a burning bush in this generation? You know what would happen? Most people would miss it. Why would people miss it? Because they'd be looking down on their iPhones. Here's a burning bush. Well, here's Facebook. And here's my Snapchat. And here's Instagram. And I wonder how many people in this generation are missing out on God's call because they're distracted. What a shame. What a tragedy it will be in eternity when people stand before God and they realize that Instagram stripped them of their calling. What a tragedy it will be. Because they were addicted to TV and this show and that show and entertainment that God said, I had something to tell you, but you were too distracted. So I gave it to this person. I don't know about you, I'm not willing to miss out on what God has for me. I'm keeping my eyes open, my ears open. If I need to get alone, I'll get alone. Because that's where God speaks. And God called him out of the bush. Moses, Moses, and he said, here I am. And this is amazing. Then he said, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. Out of all the articles of clothing, why the sandals? Does anybody know or can you guess? It's because the bottom of the sandals when you're walking it like picks up everything that you want to so like I see it's like it represents picking up the dirt in the world and that's what's separating him from like the full presence of God, God's holiness so picking off this representing putting aside everything he's bringing in with him from the world and just being did everybody hear that? does everybody agree with that? yeah, know what? so I don't know I'm just going to say it so um when in the first one, uh, they said that his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, does that mean that he was like, giving sight from his father-in-law? Was his thing? It could be. There's a sense in which he is not... There's, it's, there's a sense of, well, okay, what's the reason why he's telling him to take off his sandals? It tells us we don't have to guess. Why? He's saying, there, so there's something about his sandals that are unholy. I think it's a respect. That's part of it. It's a respect in this time, taking off your shoes before certain individuals is a sign of respect. Absolutely, there's reverence. Yeah, Nathan? Um, wasn't it that in that culture, if you, if you went inside the king, you had to take off your shoes? Yes, absolutely, you're right. You're dead on. If there's a king, if there's somebody of great importance, you do take off your shoes as a sign of reverence. But I would agree with Gil's interpretation of it as well is that the sandals carried something. Think about it. He was a shepherd. He was walking around in the wilderness. What's underneath your shoes? Dirt, dung, filth. And so this is symbolic that he could not come near God because of his sandals. And the same reason why people cannot come near to God today is because of their sandals. Say, what do you mean? Say this. Is that if you and I want to come near to God, look, he says, do not come near for you are about to stand on holy ground. Take off your sandals. The sandals represent worldly things, unholy things, things about that he's picked up throughout his life, things that he's picked up throughout his day. This isn't over-interpreting it. Remember Jesus with his own disciples in John 13, 10. He says, your whole body is clean except your feet. I've come to wash your feet. What was he speaking of there? He was telling them, he was declaring to them, except for one, that they were made clean. It was a foreshadowing. It was a foretelling of the gospel. That through the gospel, through the blood of Jesus Christ, we are made clean, except our feet. Meaning what? That we're not, we're partially saved? No, it's that as we walk through this world, we carry dirt. We've got to come to God for confession. We have to come to Christ to be cleansed. We have to implement a certain discipline in order to walk in holiness. And so the feet 
represent our walk in the world. And here's this man coming to the presence of God, but he could not come near unless he took off his sandals. And you and I will be limited in our knowledge of the presence of God if we keep our sandals on. If we're not willing to remove ourselves from filth and unholy things, there is no way we can grow in our nearness of God. Who shall ascend on the hill of the Lord? And who shall stand in His holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart and does not swear to see me or lift up his soul to what is false. And God, I come into your presence. Well, you can't come. Why? Because you're carrying something on your sandals that cannot stand in holy ground. Remove it. So if I want to come nearer to God, i got to be able to remove my shoes and be able to leave those things behind me and walk forward. So many people don't know the nearness of God. Why? Because they have filthy feet. God calls us to wash our feet, to remove our sandals, so to speak, and say, you know what? It's not worth it because I want to come nearer to Him. So I remove the dirt. I remove the dung. I remove the filth. The things that would be an offense to God in His presence. The things that can't dwell. It's a law. It's not a matter of preference. It's a law. God is too holy. He's holy. This whole thing is about the holiness of God. We are being introduced for the first time in the Bible, the holiness of God, because it is the theme of the book of Exodus. Here he couldn't come before him because of his feet. In chapter 19, the whole nation couldn't come before the mountain because if they touched it, they would have died. It's all about God being holy and about how we must be able to implement certain things in order to approach his holiness. So he says, take off your sandals. And you and I need to determine whether we are willing to do so in order to have the nearness of God. It's uncomfortable to take off your shoes sometimes. To walk barefoot in the wilderness? But is it worth it? We have to determine that for ourselves. And you can guarantee two things. If you are willing to give God your full attention and if you are willing to remove the sandals that are hindering you from coming to the presence of God in a great way. Two things you can guarantee for yourself. That God will reveal Himself to us and that God will reveal what He has for us. When you and I decide to give God our full attention, and when you and I decide to take off our sandals and walk into His presence, you can guarantee two things. God revealing Himself to you, and God revealing what He has for you. Isn't that what happens? What happens the moment He takes off His suit? Verse 6, And He said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He reveals Himself. But He wasn't going to reveal Himself until He took off His sandals. So he was willing to leave behind the filth of the world, the compromise, the dirt, the dung, all the things that he's picked up. God reveals himself. And in the next few verses, God reveals his calling. Isn't that what Paul asked God? The Christ, when he sees him on the Damascus road, what, is he, what was the first question he asked? Who are you, Lord? Right? I am Jesus Christ whom you are persecuting. And then what does he ask? What do you want me to do? And this is what's happening with Moses. He's, re he's being revealed about who God is, and he's about to be revealed what he's going to do for him. And when you and I come into the presence of God with full attention, when you and I come into the presence of God, removing the, the sandals off our feet, we can believe that God will speak to us about himself and what God will reveal to us in the next season of our life. It's worth it. So what does he say in verse 7? Let's read verse 7 down. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of the land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. To the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, and all the other ites. And now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. So what's happening here? Well, we just saw that God revealed who He was, and now He's about to reveal what He has planned for Him. And guess what? It makes all of it worth it. The wilderness, the loneliness, the humbling, the attention that you give, willing to pull yourself out from the crowd, all of it is worth it when God speaks to you about himself in a way that you've never known. Have you ever, I just want to just stop you for a second. Have you ever read this book 
Have you ever read just in your daily devotion and you've read through that text so many times and a verse comes out to you like it's never come out to you and it's not just some new information. It's not something for an insight in your sermon or your Bible teaching. No, it's for you. It's for you. I'm not saying it happens every time, but I'm saying when it does happen, it has lifelong impact. Well, you, you read this and you say, that, that's exactly what I need. That, that was for me. This is something about God that I've never seen before. This is something about my life that I never knew I needed to know. That's available. So what does he say here from verse, verse uh, 7 down to verse 10? Yes, ma'am. It's crazy. It says, I have come to deliver them. The it says, I will send you. Absolutely. He says, I have come to deliver them. And he says, but I'm sending you to do it. Absolutely. In Exodus 2, it talks about how God heard their groaning. And it's once he heard their groaning that then he sent them. That's it. That's a huge insight as well. Both great insights. Look at the heart of God in verse 7. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people in Egypt. I have heard their cry, and I know their sufferings. He's seen, he's heard, and he's known the things that the people of God are going through. That's God. Do we really believe that about God? That when we're going through affliction, he sees, he hears, and he knows. He's nearer than we actually think. And it's verses like this that we got to hold on to this and say, okay, God, I might not feel like you're there. I might not see it. I might not know it, but you do. You're there. You see it. You feel it. You know it. You're there. I believe it. But here's the bondage. Here's the affliction that's been going on for hundreds of years. And as our sister just said, it wasn't until they called upon God that he moves. Look at verse 10. Verse 9. And now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me. It wasn't until the cry reached God that he decided to move. That's the glorious hope, is that when we pray, when we call upon God, God moves. That's the beauty of prayer. That's the beauty of intercession, is that we can wallow up in pain. Thank you so much. We can wallow up in pain. We can wallow up in stuff, all these different things. But until we muster up the strength to cry out to God to hear us is when he begins to move. What else can we say here? Verse 9, I have come down to deliver them out of Egypt. The hand of the Egyptians and to bring them out of the land to a good and broad land. But then in verse 10 he says, come, I will send you to Pharaoh. What can we say about that? I just think it's great because like literally like what God's commanding you know, Moses to do, what's going to happen is going to flip everything upside down. Because you're talking about, there's probably kids in there who grew up their entire lives knowing that they were going to be slaves. Right. And so it's just like a total change. It's like, you know, we have a God, we believe in a God who grew mountains in this, in this instance. He's, you know, changing a nation. Absolutely. It gives us insight into how God works, though. It gives us insight into how He does things in the earth. You know how He does it? Through men. He does it through men. We know this. But God looks for men to be agents of His will. God looks for men that are so surrendered to Him that He can use them as extensions of His deliverance to people. This isn't some hype, excitement, insight. This is true for today. God is continually looking for men to recruit. And as I just said earlier, you know what He's looking down upon? Today, I believe with all my heart, a bunch of distracted kids. People that are not really believing this book. People that are not believing that God is really looking for a man to stand in the gap to do something for this generation. Firework Christianity. Dead. Let's wait till next year. Dead. God is looking for men that are surrendered, and he found it in Moses. He says, I want to do something in the earth, and I'm looking for somebody. He says, the eyes of the Lord look to and fro throughout the whole world to see whose hearts are completely blameless towards him, that he may give them strong support. What a glorious truth. I mean, just think about that. Let's get, let's just, for a second, think about it. God is really looking for somebody to do something. And whether we believe it or not, every single person here has a calling like Moses. Maybe not to its extent. Maybe not to the extent of which Moses does it. But the principle and the task is the same for every single believer. 
To do what? To bring people out of Egypt into the domain of God. That is the call of every individual. It doesn't matter if you work at this place. It doesn't matter if you do this. It does not matter what you do. Every person is called to bring people out of the bondage of Pharaoh. Whether it's two people or like Moses, two million people. It does not matter. We all have the same job. What did he tell Apostle Paul? He says, I'm sending you to do what? To open their eyes that they may come out of darkness into the light, out of the power of Satan, into the power of God, that they may receive forgiveness and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So all of us have the same calling. Go into Egypt. Pull them out. Bring them into my domain. Bring them into my kingdom. Bring them into my family. And he's just looking for people that are willing to do it. Say, so, well, that's Old Testament. It's not Old Testament. It's New Testament. It's all over the New Testament. How many people refuse to surrender their riches, refuse to answer the cost of following Jesus and miss out on being disciples? The rich young ruler missed out on being a disciple. I'm sure he regrets it now. All these different people that walked out on Christ. And Jesus even told his disciples, I'm looking for laborers. Would you pray to the Lord of the harvest for laborers? He's looking still to this day. He's looking. He's recruiting. He's, his eyes are to and fro. I want to deliver some people, but I'm looking for a man. And he finds it. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Verse 11. Look at this response. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? Looks like those 30-something years of shepherding work, didn't it? Why? Because we see different Moses than we did in Exodus chapter 2. Don't we? Look back at verse 11 in Exodus chapter 2 and let's see the Moses that we saw a couple weeks ago. One day when Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and looked on their burdens and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. He looked this way and that and seeing no one, he struck down the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. And we know from Acts that the reason why he did this is because he had something in his heart concerning his people and he wanted to perform God's will, but he was doing it his own way. He wanted to perform God's will, but he was doing it in his own strength. He wanted to do God's will, but he was doing it with his own strategy. And God says, you're too strong. I can't use you right now. You have to be weak. Paul said, I boast in my weakness so that the power of Christ can rest on me. Do you feel unworthy? Do you feel weakness? Good, you're a candidate for great things for God. The moment you begin to think that you're strong, the moment you can depend on your charisma, on your knowledge, on all these different things, God can't use you. You want to know what God's recruitment plan is? The foolish things of this world. The weak things of this world. The things that are none so that they can make the things that are nothing. That's God's recruitment plan. That is His criteria. Do you feel like you can't do it? Good, it's because I want to do it through you and you can't take the glory from it. Moses, I, I know this is in my heart, but I can't do this. How, how am I going to do it? A few years ago, he thought he could do it. He goes, all right, yeah, you're going to beat up my little brother? All right, here we go. Let me kill you. He goes, into the wilderness. Now he wants him, and he has him exactly where he's planned to have him. In a place where he says, I can't do it. There's no way. And he kind of goes a little bit too much into it, because God says, come on, I'm going to be with you. Okay, get Aaron. Extra humble. There's nothing wrong with that. He says what? Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh? Exactly. You're nobody. You're dust and ashes. The way God can use you is the same way He can sit you down. The same way He can find you is the same way He can find somebody else. And this is the turning point for Moses' life. Verse 12, he said, But I will be with you. That's the difference. But I will be with you. We just talked about it. 
In Exodus chapter 2, he thought he could do it in his own strength. He thought he could do it in his own might. He thought he could do it based on his own strategy. And God says, you can only go so far with that kind of thinking. And so he brings us to a place where he feels hopeless. Have you ever prayed a prayer that you wanted God to use you so bad, but at the same time you said, there's no way. I don't understand how it can even work. I don't understand how it can even happen. You know, you can pray big prayers. God is a big God. If you ever feel like that, that's a good place to be. Because when it does happen, once again, you can't put your name on it. Only God can. He says, I know you can't do it. That's why I will be with you. I'll be with you. And so what you try to do, I can do it. What you and I think we can do, what would take us a thousand years can take God one day. That's the whole purpose of this. Moses wanted to take out one Egyptian at a time. Here's one Egyptian. Okay, I'll bury you. There's only so much sand to bury all those Egyptians, Moses. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to dump him in the sea for you. Let me do it my way. You know, all our failures, whether you're from this church or a different church, whether you're part of this ministry or a different ministry, if God is not with us, we'll fall on our face. We will fall on our face. But when God is with us, who can be against us? When God is with us, there is nothing that is impossible. When God's hand is upon us, that's when we see things happen. That's why prayer is vital. Prayer is my declaration of dependency on God. God, I can't do it. I look to you. I can't win a soul for my life. I can shove my head with all this apologetic knowledge. I can't win a soul apart from the Spirit of God. It says that the hand of the Lord was upon the men of Cyrene and Cyprus, and the Lord added to their number. God's hand was upon those disciples. They moved in the power of God. Unlearned, uneducated men, making the Pharisees baffle. How is it? You don't have this education, but this man is healed. Because it's the name of Jesus. But I will be with you. That is the difference. That is the factor that we need in this day. God with us. Look what he says here. I will be with you and this shall be a sign for you that I have sent you when you have brought the people out of Egypt. You shall serve God on this mountain. That was a sign. There was going to be a future sign that when you come to this mountain again, you'll know that I was with you. Does it happen? Does, does Moses come to this mountain again? If you could turn with me to Exodus 19, please. Verse 17. Look what it says here. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God. Let's just stop there. If you're a leader, your job is to bring people to God. If you're a leader of any capacity, your job is to make sure that people meet with God. Not to be impressed by you. I heard a preacher say this. I had to make up in my mind in my preaching whether I wanted to impress people or bless people. You know what? People want the former. Impress people. He says, no, God, I've, I've determined to bless people. I don't want to impress them. <laughs> Moses here is bringing the people to meet with God. And they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. There's fire, more fire. God is a consuming fire. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln. And the whole mountain trembled greatly. And as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him in thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain, and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. You want to see what happens when God is with you? When the Lord assures your life and your ministry and your calling that His hand is upon it? Where was Moses in Exodus chapter 3? Moses was leading sheep and was standing before a burning bush. But because God was with him, we see him in Exodus 19, not leading sheep, leading a nation, not standing before a burning bush, but before a burning mountain. See, when God is with us, we will be shocked of where he will take us. I don't know about, I don't know about you. We've seen burning bushes. I want to see a burning mountain. 
Isn't it amazing that he starts out to see this bush, maybe a few diameters in length, burning? And it was amazing. And God says, you have no idea what I have to show you next. But God found him first with sheep, and then he gave him people. God showed him a burning bush. And I believe it stirred a hunger for Moses to see a burning mountain. You say, why? Because he says, show me your glory in Exodus 33. This man did not cease to be hungry. Why? Because the mountain never stops. It only goes higher and higher. And it's dependent upon my hunger and your hunger. You will stop at your knowledge of God based on how hungry you are. If you're satisfied, then you're satisfied. But the difference maker in Moses' ministry and his life was this one verse, verse 12. But I will be with you. And when God is with us, you will be amazed at where he will take us. If God is not with us, we'll stay at the same level and we'll only gradually increase. And that's why we need God Almighty. We need the Holy Ghost. We need the Holy Spirit. We've got to be unsatisfied with where we are in Christ. A holy dissatisfaction. A holy hunger for the things of God. That's what takes us to the next level. There is one thing that Moses had it's what we all need. If we can't relate to Moses because of his calling or because of the dispensation that he was in, that's fine. But there's one thing we can all apply. Moses was hungry and Moses was humble. You have those characteristics, you will be more than okay in this life. But I will be with you. Let's pray.